director for the digital economy at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. And this is actually my second week and first webinar. So I'm very excited to be here. I do have two virtual housekeeping items, if I may bring them to your attention. Number one, kindly mute your mic. So uh, we have the best possible audio for Andrew Loschmann, the CEO of Field Effect. And for any questions that you may have, please use the Slido application. So before I start, um, or let's say Andrew starts, um, I would like to give a brief overview on Field Effect, so you know a little bit more about the company that we'll be presenting today. Um, so Field Effect provides advanced integrated cybersecurity threat detection, incident monitoring and compliance all in one platform, developed especially for SMEs and IT service providers. The company is proudly Canadian and they're passionate about protecting Canadian business through prevention, education, and also awareness. Field Effects team brings decades of experience securing complex, ever-changing security environments. And the result is a company committed to creating stronger networks, improving proactive response, and increasing efficiency with an end-to-end -end approach that empowers businesses to build more secure operations. Field Effect is also, as you can see uh, perhaps from the slide, a much valued member of our essential business services. So a little bit about Andrew Loschmann. He has a big bio, so I will keep it very brief. He is the Chief Operating Officer of Field Effect and will be presenting today. So Andrew has a 20 year background building and managing IT security products and programs, including 30 years in government intelligence, defense and security policy development within the government of Canada's Privy Council office. Andrew also contributed to Canada's cybersecurity strategy and his technical background includes development of software and systems, cybersecurity analysis, and leading incident detection and response teams. So without much further ado, Andrew, may I please hand the floor or the slides and screens to you? All right, welcome. Thank you very much. Can, uh, and thank, thank you for that. So I, I, I assume you can hear me given that uh, we're having a conversation. So that's good. Um, all right, so we'll see if uh, the presentation gods are with us. Um, so, cybersecurity for SMEs in 2020 and, and this work uh, from home era. Uh, just going to click through a, a few things here quickly. Uh, the first is, uh, as mentioned, uh, I'm an electrical engineer. I have a background in uh, government development uh, within the national defense space as well as security analytics. Uh, and I've also had some leadership roles uh, within that domain as well. Uh, I've had the opportunity to do software development, uh, develop uh, bespoke analytics, as well as uh, the fortune to spend some time in Privy Council uh, working on policy related items. And, and when I was in the federal government, uh, I, I was able to contribute to things like uh, Canada's first uh, national cybersecurity strategy. Uh, today, uh, I'm at Field Effect. Um, I'm in charge of day-to-day -day business operations, but also security operations and running the analytics and, and the systems that help protect uh, our, our customers. And so that means spotting bad things and, and helping our clients to build more secure networks. We also do a, a significant amount of incident response in there. Uh, I'm here representing the company. Oh, there might be somebody with their microphone on. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here representing Field Effect. Uh, very proud uh, to be here uh, with the Chamber. We're thrilled to be partnering on this webinar. Uh, and just a quick hello to uh, local chambers and members from across the country. Thanks for being here and thanks for, for having us. So, I know cybersecurity can be an intimidating topic. Some people don't know how big of an issue it can be. Some things like COVID and work from home create a sense that, that things are changing, perhaps continuously. Uh, some people may feel that it's too expensive uh, of an issue to deal with for their business. Uh, and it's also maybe one of those, those topics that is, is perhaps easier not to think about. 
so I hope at the end of the hour, we can have addressed in some way these points, uh, provided maybe a small uh, bit of insight and, and information to help you protect your business. And then we have some time for questions at the end that may be on your mind, whether they're big and small. So, so keep note of them and, and would love to hear them uh, at the end of the presentation. So in 2020, since cybersecurity is a big topic and one that changes over time, it's important to take a minute and review where we are at a high level in 2020. I find that statistics are a helpful guide in business and cybersecurity data and facts are key. Within Canada, there's an organization called CIRA and they perform an annual cybersecurity survey, which I think is one of the best of its type uh, there in the world, period. Uh, and by way of background, CIRA is a not-for-profit uh, based out of Ottawa, uh, where we're located, and has a primary role in managing the, the .ca domain, but also invests heavily in a stronger and more secure internet for Canadians. The survey that they released in 2019, so the most recent one, holds a mirror up to what we are seeing operationally at Field Effect. In other words, uh, the survey does a great job at reflecting operational cybersecurity concerns uh, within Canada. And what the survey tells us is that in 2019, 71%, which is a big number, 71% of respondents reported experiencing at least one cyber attack uh, that impacted the organization in some way. And that would include uh, taking time and resources away from the business to deal with it, uh, out-of-pocket expenses, as well as things that uh, uh, are like paying ransom to, to ransomware actors. Uh, this is a notable increase from years gone by where those numbers were much lower. Uh, and to be honest, probably were underreported. So within Canada, um, historically, there's been a sense of this probably won't happen to me more so than we've observed in international markets where uh, there's perhaps a heightened sense of, of, uh, of severity or concern around cybersecurity that is now coming uh, into the Canadian market and, and changes afoot. Uh, in 2019, some more statistics, almost 60% uh, said that they, of uh, businesses and respondents, said that they were going to be uh, investing in cybersecurity to help secure customer information and ensure their ability to continue operations. Uh, if you look back a couple years, back in 2018, only 35% of businesses said they'd be uh, increasing financial resources towards cybersecurity. In 2019, that is now over 50% at 54%. So the, the sense that there's a problem and that, that uh, an investment is required to address the problem is, is now uh, near and present. So if we can accept that there's a problem and there's more uh, awareness of cybersecurity, cybersecurity incidents, and maybe all of us have had some relationship to a cybersecurity incident, whether it's uh, directly or a colleague or a friend that has had a business impacted by cybersecurity, um, what, are, what are some of the things that, that could be impacted? In other words, why would you care about cybersecurity? And there's a lot of reasons. Uh, Primarily, however, uh, is that at the end of the day, the bottom line of your business and your ability to operate will be impacted if you do not uh, take steps and measures to help strengthen your business in the face of, of the cybersecurity threat. So one of the things that uh, I think is really important to think about is, is a business's ability to operate. So we provide, as mentioned, quite a bit of incident response for businesses around the world, although primarily in Canada and the United States. Uh, and sometimes a cyber incident can have minimal, minimal impact and minimal effects. Uh, a lot of times, however, it can be debilitating. So imagine for a moment that right after this call, you came back to your office and found that you couldn't access any of your files for any reason on any of the company file servers, and the IT department told you that the backups look like they are taken or ransomed as well. What would you do? Or imagine that you're a not-for-profit and that your business and your operations require using the VoIP phone system to make calls to, to partners and to, to donors. Uh, and then just like that, that capability was taken away from you. Uh, or that emails are thought to have been compromised and you're not sure how or why or whether it's even, enough, even uh, if it's safe to communicate with your colleagues. 
these are major impacts uh, and and it really has um, uh, uh, like I said, an impact on businesses, particularly if you're not prepared for the possibility. Another piece that fits into the picture is financial loss. Uh, I know that there's a lot of big numbers out there. Uh, the Accenture Cost of Cyber Security Survey pointed out that in Canada, the average cost of investigating and remediating an attack, a cyber attack, uh, was $9.25 million. Now, I'm not sure if that particular number uh, helps or hinders from a small to mid-sized business perspective, uh, because on one hand, that's, that's a big number, it's impressive. On the other hand, it, it seems so big uh, that it can lose its significance or perhaps not feel relevant to businesses that aren't of the very largest size. Uh, and, and it can lead us to feeling that maybe it's a big company problem. I can say, however, that in the incidents that we help with, it doesn't matter if it's a dentist's office with five people or a multinational of 2,500 employees, the financial cost of cybersecurity incidents is real. Uh, and, and, and it may not be $9 million real, but, it, but given that nobody really wants to spend even a dollar more than they need to, uh, when you're talking tens of thousands of dollars, even hundreds of thousands of dollars, in some cases, millions of dollars, um, it, it can uh, be very material. Uh, reputational harm. Uh, in the 2019 CERO report, 13% of respondents said that a cyber attack damaged their business. So that's 13%, so roughly one in 10. In another CERO report, however, four out of five Canadians said they would no longer do business with a company if their personal data was exposed in a cyber breach. So that's eight out of 10. So there's a huge gap between where businesses are understanding today what the impact of reputation might be as a result of a cyber incident and where the minds of Canadians uh, and their customers are. And then finally, the last big piece is uh, regular, uh, increasing uh, regulatory or legal obligations, most notably in Canada for PETA, uh, the reality of mandatory disclosure is uh, is present and it's here and it's been here since late November 2018. So that means that if your business, if you're holding this, uh, uh, data of Canadians and you're um, a Canadian business, uh, as of late 2018, if there was a breach of what's called security safeguards, um, you are compelled to file a notice with the Privacy Commissioner of Canada as well as notify uh, your uh, customers or the people that were affected. 43% of respondents in the CIRA survey were unaware of uh, these mandatory breach requirements. So <clears throat> how can we do better? Uh, if, if, if we've arrived at accepting that cybersecurity is a, a, a present threat um, and that's affecting businesses, what, what do we do about it? Uh, and I think it's quite easy to feel defeated uh, from the outset and maybe imagine that cybersecurity is an impossible problem, particularly for small to mid-sized businesses. So why bother? Let's leave it to insurance. Um, but I'm going to make the argument that this is not true. It is in fact a solvable problem and, and one that we can address. Uh, to, to help us along this path, let's take a read from the original cybersecurity expert, uh, Sun Tzu. I'm going to read from the slide. He says, if uh, you know the enemy and you know yourself, in a hundred battles, you will never be in peril. When you are ignorant of the enemy, but know yourself, your chances of winning or losing are equal. If you're ignorant both of your enemy and yourself, you are certain in every battle to be in peril. So what Mr. Ziff is telling us is that it is important to understand who is attacking you so that you can predict what their objective is and then defend accordingly. So for example, if you're thinking about an alarm system for your home, you don't typically imagine that you're defending against a foreign military um, uh, to conceive of what the sort of defenses would be. You're not imagining that a helicopter is gonna drop uh, uh, troops onto your house and, and, and they're gonna be executing elite military maneuvers to uh, uh, get hold of your silverware. So, it's similarly important to build up cybersecurity defenses that make sense economically and will work against the people aiming to do you and your business harm. 
The alternative, as I said, is to drown in a sea of options and risk over or under engineering a solution for your needs, or worse, just simply giving up. And as an aside, in cybersecurity, we borrow heavily from the spirit of this notion, and we call this cyber situational awareness. So beyond this being an important concept, it's also something that you can use to test the strength of your organization's cybersecurity. And we define cyber situational awareness as being uh, the act of knowing your system. So what computers do you have? What IoT devices on your network? Knowing the threats to your system. So who's going to be attacking you? And then finally, knowing what to do in response to those threats. <clears throat> All right, with all of this in mind, what are the actual threats to a Canadian SME in 2020 today? And here's a threat. The criminal in this photo is running away with a bag of money, and it's your money. I think real examples are, are really helpful. Uh, here we have Mr. Karim Baratov, uh, who is an unusually Canadian angle in this whole cybersecurity dynamic. Uh, he was implicated and, and ultimately convicted of breaches related to the 2014 hack of Yahoo accounts, if anybody uh, remembers those. And, and what we can say about Mr. Baratov is that he, that he likes money, uh, that he knew how to monetize technical cyber threats, and that he had easy access to the tools and tradecraft he needed to be able to, to implement these attacks. Uh, I'll, I'll concede that that first picture is, is, is maybe a little bit sinister. Uh, here is another picture of the same, uh, the same man uh, outside his home in Ancaster, Ontario. Uh, and, and really what I want to illustrate here is that hackers are just clever people uh, that like computers and also have a business sense or can spot uh, opportunity as it would be. So do, do we think that Mr. Baratov matters six years later in, in 2020? Uh, yes, uh, he does, uh, because uh, the same types of people are at work. It's just that there are more of them and that they're more uh, sophisticated and capable than they've ever been. The, the threats to our businesses have become so prolific and well understood that it's not even uncommon anymore to have a national government put up a help, help, or help wanted, a wanted poster uh, uh, against specific individuals known to be behind individual attacks. Uh, the gentleman here uh, on the right is linked uh, to a number of Russian-based hacks, including against uh, the German parliament. And the courts in certain countries, the US and Germany being notable examples recently, will even indict foreign government officials. So think about that for a second. We're at a point here in 2020 where we largely know and understand what is happening from a cyber threat perspective against our networks, uh, even to the, to the level of being able to pinpoint individuals that are, are doing this in a legal context. Uh, so considering how difficult that is to do, it should give you some pause in terms of knowing that when industry recommendations and regulations are passed, uh, that there is science and evidence behind it. In 2020, cybersecurity is, is no longer a guess. We kind of went over a couple different actors, and, and so like, let's take a moment to discuss the types of threat actors or attackers that are out there today. I think there's many different ways that you could split up the classes or categories of attackers. Uh, I happen to like groups of three, so we'll go with uh, nation state, which are sometimes uh, known as APT or advanced persistent threat, uh, cyber criminals, and then finally nuisance threats. Uh, each of these three actors or category of actors have different motivations and different skills and resourcing levels. So a nation state actor um, will be well resourced and will be focused primarily on intelligence gathering or executing on national objectives, whatever that means for the given country. They are structured highly capable and they create their own capabilities. Uh, they are permanent, patient, and persistent. A cyber criminal is not that much different in 2020. Uh, however, they are almost always financially motivated. So they're looking for the dollar at the end of the day. 
whether that's through ransomware or through other um, uh, scams or through doing financial redirection attacks. They're pretty well resourced. Uh, it's not uh, individuals in their basement. They are structured and they are highly effective. Uh, the nation state, I, I said that they're highly capable, meaning they're technically sophisticated. They're able to create their own tools. Uh, a cyber criminal is highly effective. So they, they understand who their victims are and they understand how they should attack them. And they use other uh, organizations' capabilities. And, and really the way cyber criminals work in 2020 is that they form an ecosystem. So uh, cyber criminals will specialize in certain techniques. Some might focus on ransomware, some might focus on spear phishing, some might even focus on the art of negotiating ransomware. And so what you end up ha having are uh, networks that are hacked and then sold on the dark, uh, dark web uh, so that another hacker or another group can, or cyber criminal can uh, move in and then buy access and then work directly with the victim to obtain money in, in some way, shape, or form. Finally, we have the nuisance threat, uh, who are, are typically personally or financially motivated. They will have minimal resources. They'll be ad hoc, uh, sometimes effective. Uh, generally, they're, uh, they're seeking adventure. They have curiosity or, or simply they're bored. Um, if anybody remembers, the CRA suffered an attack, a, a heart bleed. Uh, using the Heartbleed vulnerability, it was a, a Canadian who was based out of Ontario again uh, that had implemented that attack. And, and despite the fact there was a meaningful impact, they, they would fall into this, this category. So um, I'm here to say that for most businesses in Canada, the modern cyber criminal is your primary concern. And this is important because Defending against different classes of attacker means that you have to think differently and you have to invest differently. And so for most businesses, uh, you're not interesting enough or important enough to attract the attention of the most sophisticated actors. There are, of course, exceptions to this. A very large enterprise like a bank obviously has very uh, important um, uh, assets that, that could be of uh, value to uh, a foreign state or highly sophisticated actors. There are also unique verticals that exist, uh, for instance, natural resources within Canada. And those, com those companies and organizations might be of interest uh, to foreign states as well. And then finally, uh, there are entities that, that have other uh, important information of those types of organizations. Uh, that uh, might be a proxy for an attacker to get access to the banks or get access to the national national natural resources organization. So that would be uh, like an accountant or especially a law firm uh, would be targeted in a, in a very serious way. Uh, I did see a hand go up there. I'm not sure, uh, Ricky, how we wanted to hand, handle that. If there's a quick question, I don't mind taking it. Um, Oh, uh, of course, if you're willing. So that would be, uh, as I call it, a question from the floor. So I see Debbie. Um, so if you're willing, Andrew, um, absolutely, Debbie, then please do go ahead and raise your question if you wish. All right, perhaps uh, that was uh, left for later after all. So if you may wish to continue, um, Andrew, yeah. Well, sure. thank you. <laughs> there, there was Debbie and then there was one other person. I, I, and I'm sorry, the name flew by very quickly, so I wasn't able to tell. But um, I'll take another brief pause in case that individual. Oh, no. OK. We'll carry on. So um, if we accept that most businesses are facing uh, sophisticated cyber criminals as, as threats, we can assume that we know uh, our enemy, but then what do we do about it? It can seem daunting, uh, particularly those without a background in cybersecurity, and especially for those without a deep familiarity of IT. The two documents that I've displayed on the page are from Australian and US publications that provide historical data trend research uh, and basically arrive at the same conclusion that we, we've spoken about, but they also um, talk about uh, the most common threats uh, that are affecting businesses and, and how um, similar they are. And I'm gonna get into that in just a second. 
So, so the fact that cyber criminals are structured, highly effective, uh, and um, you know, sounds like they might be impossible to defeat, uh, they're not. All right, so Sunsa is back with two additional pieces of, of wisdom for us. The first is victorious warriors win first and then go to war, while defeated warriors go to war first and then seek to win. So here's the next piece of cybersecurity wisdom. You don't need space lasers. If you get the basics right, you're going to do okay. If you ignore them, you're almost certainly going to suffer a cybersecurity incident. All too often, we try and solve cybersecurity problems only once an incident has occurred. And this is like the warrior in Sensei's example uh, of going to war without preparation and simply hoping to win. The second quote is that the greatest victory is that which requires no battle. And the idea here is that by implementing well understood security practices, you will defend your network sufficiently to avoid a compromise to begin with. So you won't need to go to battle if you found a way to discourage and defeat your adversary out of the gate. Back to those reports that I had up on, on the screen. Uh, this really helps contextualize what I mean by getting the basics right or that the problems are well understood. So here's a page from one of the reports uh, where the FBI talks about the most common and frequent ways that attackers succeeded uh, attacking organizations from 2016 through to 2019. And I'm gonna read, foreign cyber actors continue to exploit publicly known and often dated software vulnerabilities against broad target sets, including public and private sector organizations. Exploitation of these vulnerabilities often requires fewer resources as compared with zero day exploits, which is a fancy term of saying high end exploits are unknown for which no patches are available. The public and private sectors could degrade some foreign cyber threats to US interests through an increased effort to patch their systems and implement programs to keep system patching up to date. Okay, so it's understandably US centric, but in short, implementing existing and known cybersecurity practices will help national security. That's a strong statement. They are not saying that years of research and Google level dollars are needed. They are not saying that big bank grade machine intelligence is needed to stop the threats. They are saying that simple, accessible and attainable practices will in fact make a difference. I'm gonna get into some more details here, but before I do, uh, I wanna address the elephant in the room that everybody is talking about and that is video conferencing. And so is video conferencing secure? Uh, generally, the short answer is yes. Uh, we obviously had quite a bit of media related to a specific vendor um, and uh, that it was Zoom, I'm gonna say it because uh, the, the threat was called Zoom bombing, so it's, it's kind of implied. When we think about what this means, uh, those that were doing Zoom bombing, uh, really were what we would call in the right-hand column, the nuisance threats. So they were exploiting a configuration issue with Zoom video conferences, but it isn't what you would consider to be a traditional cybersecurity concern. It's an important concern, it is security related, but it is not something that we're, we're thinking about when we're, we're talking about exploits or phishing attacks and so on. The other issue that was present uh, is where data centers for video conferencing software and video conferencing systems are hosted. And so in the case of some uh, video conferencing uh, systems, uh, the, the data centers are or were hosted overseas. And that can be a privacy concern, particularly if you're thinking about the left column, which are uh, nation state threats that perhaps could compel businesses operating in those countries to turn over data or even video streams of those services. So while this was good um, and, and helped raise the profile of uh, cybersecurity, certainly as it relates to the COVID era, um, I think that Zoom in particular uh, underwent uh, 
about 10 years of security development in about 10 days of time. So they, they, they maybe suffered from a little bit of attention uh, more broadly than, than they otherwise would have had. Um, and it is possible that there may have been a little bit of a, um, an overreaction on the part of, of society or media in general related to the security risks uh, related to video conferencing. Now, that's not to say that there aren't risks and there aren't security things, privacy elements that you need to be thinking about very carefully. Um, however, uh, inherently, uh, it's not uh, rated among uh, th the biggest things that I would worry about personally. So with the, the last few slides, I'd like to provide a high level snapshot of, of where we see things and field effect happening on the internet in terms of real and present internet threats or cyber threats, and then suggest an approach for how to handle cybersecurity for your business. So in our operations at Field Effect, we do see quite a bit of data. Uh, early on, we released some of this publicly, uh, and our conclusion was that uh, in general, our customers had moved from their offices to their homes, and that in general, our customers were actually practicing pretty good um, cybersecurity habits and were using VPNs to connect back into their headquarters. Um, if we look back in 2019, the primary threats that, that we see and we're helping defend against and performing incident response for are related to ransomware and financial redirection. So everybody should understand ransomware, I think. Uh, financial redirection is when an attacker assumes or uses a digital identity owned by somebody or an organization. So for example, an email address and then um, uses that digital identity to convince somebody or to actually move money from the company into a bank account owned or controlled by the attacker. So in the early days, this would inevitably be a bank account in Hong Kong. Uh, and so, um, so that's really what we were dealing with. The, the way that we saw this happening was through an email compromise, whether it's spear phishing or a content delivery attack, so the traditional malicious attachment, but also through uh, RDP compromise, remote desktop compromise. And this is a Windows service that people would use to access their computer from home basically uh, providing a direct line from the internet to your computer using Microsoft Windows uh, RDP protocol, and that was being attacked and breached. Now, uh, what are we seeing uh, as changes uh, in the last six months? You're gonna notice uh, not a lot. And I would argue that that's predictable and also important to reflect on. So the people interested in you have not changed and their motivations have not changed either. They still want your money. So we're still seeing ransomware, we're still seeing financial direction or redirection. The difference is that while we're still seeing the same email compromises uh, occurring and, and those kinds of attacks uh, still ongoing, uh, we're now seeing an increased focus on edge device compromises, which I'm gonna speak about in, in the next slide. There are a few small differences, however, so if you recall, hackers are opportunistic, particularly cyber criminals. Uh, that means they're gonna understand uh, the COVID uh, and work from home era and that it brings opportunity to them. So even though hackers are still sending phishing emails, they're using current events to, to make their attacks more effective. So they're gonna be using COVID style phishing lures and emails to, to try to bring you in. This can mean preying on your interest in news or trying to fool people into thinking they are receiving notices related to government programs, uh, most often money related. So governments around the world have been reporting cases where phishing campaigns are seeking to replicate legitimate government outreach to businesses and to individuals in need. Uh, you know, it's fairly poor form on the part of uh, these, uh, these attackers to do it in this way, but um, that's, that's the way they are and that's the way it is. Uh, just this last week, uh, Google's TAG or the Threat, uh, threat uh, Analyst Group uh, highlighted uh, the emergence of hackers for hire in India, which um, actually is not uh, a traditional place that we see a lot of uh, hacking for hire coming from. Uh, and that these uh, organizations in India were uh, targeting uh, uh, businesses and individuals with WHO related emails, the World Health Organization related emails and, and attacks. So, so we are seeing a change in tactics. It's the same technique, but they're, they're just moder moderating accordingly. 
<clears throat> and the next change, of course, is, is that uh, hackers are focusing on new parts of your network or your threat surface uh, that they know are available, and, and that is edge devices, and, and we'll talk about that uh, on the next slide here. What is an edge device? Uh, so I, I've mentioned that edge devices are now, now being targeted by threat actors. Uh, an edge device is anything on your network that directly connects to the internet. So that can be a firewall. It can be your email server. If you still have an email server and you're not using a hosted email in the cloud, it could be your VPN router that uh, all of your staff and employees are using to connect into the business remotely or even an application server that you're using to help support the customers or uh, your employees as they're distributed outside of the brick and mortar office. Attackers are increasingly focused on these devices because they know they can access them over the internet. And that's the key part really. It's, it's somewhat obvious, but, but they need to have something that they can attack so that they can get access to your network. And by definition, edge devices are connected to the internet. And attackers also know that now in 2020, there's going to be more of them as we decentralize our work environments and as we make more and more services available remotely to our employees and, and to, to our customers as well. Uh, the other thing that attackers know is that uh, people are obviously humans and that they that doing things quickly, as was really the case uh, with the shift out of the offices to support work from home, uh, that, that moving quickly often results in mistakes being made, like opening up a security configuration vulnerability, or that IT uh, departments don't often have the appropriate resources, whether it's money or time, uh, to do all the security patching and fixes that are, that are required. And so what this means is that in addition to security awareness and training about email security, we should also be placing an emphasis on the security and use of technologies that enable remote work, whatever that means for your particular organization. Now that we've talked about who the threats are and what some of the technical problems are, uh, what is the next thing to do? So back to the CIRA report, in 2019, 43% of respondents said that they didn't employ dedicated cybersecurity capabilities because they lacked the resources to do so, whether that's financial or human resources. And that was actually up 11% from 2018. So that's actually a little bit concerning that businesses are saying, I didn't have the right resources, or IT practitioners are saying, I wasn't given the right resources to invest in cybersecurity and do the thing that's required uh, for the organization. So my message is that um, it would be important to decide that your business will invest in cybersecurity. The data shows that without preparation, uh, an incident is really more a matter of when and, and not if. And investing in cybersecurity doesn't mean just money. It can mean identifying somebody that's responsible in your organization for cybersecurity, um, and depending on the size of business, investing in individuals or hiring people to support it. It can mean also building processes and habits that strengthen awareness and capability within your organization. Uh, so an example of this would be the development of an incident response policy and then working through it. So again, back to my example of if you had an incident today, do you know who you would call for help? I can tell you that invariably incidents happen on Friday evenings and Sunday afternoons. That's it. So do you think you'll be able to find competent resources at a price you can absorb within hours at those times. Would you call your insurance company? Do you have cyber insurance? Would they help? Do they have a breach coach ready for you? And would your legal counsel, if you have one, be available to support you through the decision-making process for whether or not to file a report to the privacy commissioner? Um, and then finally, do you think that you have thought through the information that your organization has that you know where it's located on your network and that you've built in protections to ensure its survivability in the face of modern ransomware attacks. So obviously right away you're thinking, I, I, I need to do backups, but there's a way in which to do backups that will be resilient to ransomware attacks uh, because ransomware attackers 
know that people have backups and they target those as well. It's also important to think about BYOD or personal devices and what their impact is on your company's network security, whether they're present in your office or used at home. The important thing to remember here is that anything that becomes part of your network automatically becomes something that attackers will target. And the tricky part comes uh, in the fact that you cannot usually fully monitor personal devices, nor force configuration changes or settings. And so maybe making a slight um, a bit of an extreme example, do you really trust your colleague's seven-year-old who acts, has access to their personal device to make wise security choices when it comes to what software to install next to your company data or what links to click on that device? And then finally, yes, it's about investing in products and services. Uh, more and more businesses are finding that cybersecurity is closer to a utility than it is about purchasing a new piece of software or hardware. Uh, businesses often just purchase electricity from the local provider um, or hire an external firm to do their physical security monitoring. Cybersecurity is, is quite similar. And so uh, just like a physical alarm system, having visibility over the behavior of your network and the external threats to it are an important and essential part of uh, your IT operations in 2020. Uh, it is something new, but it's an important investment to make. And we're on the last slide. So in summary, we know that if you get the basics right, and we know, uh, we know that the, uh, if you get your what we call network health and hygiene correct, you're going to be far harder to attack. Uh, that is a truth, and it doesn't have to be complicated, expensive, or difficult, and it's backed by a tremendous amount of expertise and evidence. Uh, so by deploying sufficient and modern practices, tools, and technology, and investing appropriately, you're going to significantly diminish the probability and an attacker focuses on you or your company. And even if they do, you're going to be far better prepared in a much stronger position to, to, to defend against their attacks. So to help structure your approach on all of this, uh, I recommend that you find a framework that works for you, a cybersecurity framework that works for you, and build from it. Uh, in the world, there's a lot of them. Uh, a lot of the national governments in the UK, the US, and Australia have released things. Um, in the United States, there's the, the NIST cybersecurity framework. There are sometimes uh, industry-specific uh, frameworks that you can follow, um, the OEB being one of them in, inside of Canada. Uh, but I would say that one excellent resource within Canada is the document on the screen now. And it's called the Baseline uh, Cybersecurity Controls for Small and Medium Organizations. And it's published by the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity, which is a federal government organization under the wing of the Communication Security Establishment, which is really the centre of expertise uh, for cybersecurity within the federal government. And if you open up the document, you will find that it helps you in a lightweight way uh, and provides checklists to help ensure that you do a lot of the important things. So first of all, it is to rec recognizing the threats, the actual threats to your business, uh, identifying the technology and information that is present on your network. Uh, importantly, this is both for your traditional on-premise network as well as your cloud-based systems. Identifying an appropriate financial investment level within your organization. Uh, getting the minimum plans and processes in place. Most importantly, a cybersecurity incident response plan. And then also implementing the basic uh, and most effective cybersecurity safeguards, technically speaking, uh, in your network. And, and the biggest one would be uh, finding a way to identify unpatched systems within your network and ensuring that they get patched. As I mentioned, there are many, many other uh, frameworks that are available on the internet and, and from governments uh, worldwide, uh, published by ISO, I mentioned US NIST. Uh, but this one uh, happens to be particularly good for Canadian SMEs. Uh, I'll just make a quick note. Uh, I mentioned earlier, we, we at Field Effect, we pride ourselves on protecting Canadian businesses. Uh, we created a product called Covalence for this very reason. If, you're, if you are interested in learning more, there's a link on the next slide. Um, once again, however, I'd like to, to thank the Canadian Chamber and local chambers for having us. 
Uh, we're really proud to be part of the Essential Business uh, Services Program. And uh, thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to hear them and uh, open up the floor. Well, let me say thank you very much, Andrew, for this uh, really very insightful, informative presentation. Not only that, what I really liked uh, is that you uh, mentioned video conferencing while we are having a video conference. I really love that. That's a very nice connection and perhaps um, uh, a good um, another connection made, if I may point it out. And then I see somebody raise the hand. You mentioned the seven-year-old and I took note of it. Um, may I quickly ask, how early do you recommend we um, should uh, actually educate anyone on cybersecurity and the threats? Because uh, like you said, the devices are at home, we work from home, and what kind of level of education and understanding might be important there? So I, I just triggered something when I was listening to you and I found it very interesting and yeah, very relatable. Oh, um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. I, I, I actually, um, did a, a seminar on cybersecurity for for kids uh, not too long ago, and I think um, it is probably a little bit much to hope to um, convey some of the the subtle subtleties and points uh, of, of uh, primary cybersecurity points to to young children. However, I think it's extremely important in the early days to to help educate around cybersecurity safety. Um, which is a, a slight moderation on cyber security practices themselves, uh, but, but helping to raise awareness that um, the internet is a thing and that, that it's like your neighborhood. There, there are other people around, even though you might not see them, and that when you're interacting with them, that everything that you say, um, they're able to, to pick up on. Um, but, but also to understand that uh, just because um, it's uh, normal and safe to be communicating with grandma or grandpa over uh, the internet, that it's, it's not always true um, to communicate in the same way with everybody else, just like uh, it, it wouldn't be the same uh, talking with strangers in the street. Absolutely. Thanks for that. So I think there were some hands raised. So uh, let's then, uh, Andrew, if you're open to it, invite questions from the floor. And please, uh, who would like to start? Is there, is there anyone out there who wishes to raise a question? Yeah, yes, please. This is Andrew Cooper speaking from, uh, from BC. Thanks for the presentation, Andrew. I love your first name. <laughs> yeah, question, thank you. With regards to uh, file, file storing protocols, like uh, uh, Google Docs, OneDrive, uh, Dropbox, etc., how can you tell which is safe and, and which is the sort of one of the better systems for, for small businesses? Yeah. Okay. So, so I think, I think the, the question was um, given the, um, the proliferation of uh, cloud-based uh, file storage, how as a small business uh, do you choose um, uh, what is right for your business and perhaps what is, is the best in terms of a, a, a cyber security. So <clears throat> I think there's, there's, a, there's a couple things to be mindful of. Uh, the first is if you're, your business and your partnerships, so Field Effect has partnerships and as part of those, um, those partnerships, we have obligations around data sovereignty, meaning uh, you have to be able to, to declare where your data is being stored, this is particularly important if you're dealing with European com uh, companies and customers uh, through the GDPR. Uh, there are certain requirements that are in there. The good news is that Canada is on a list of um, safe countries for which GDPR um, uh, is, is um, views as, as, as being an okay country to store customer data uh, for Europeans. So, so Understanding from the service provider where they store their data would be uh, an important step. The second uh, piece is to look for um, a demonstration by that service provider that they take cybersecurity seriously. And so most of the, the good um, and secure file storage uh, solutions will offer to you um, a listing of the measures they take both physically 
and electronically to keep your data safe and secure. Um, if, if nobody's talking about it, that would be uh, a warning flag for me personally. Uh, and the other thing to look for is that in, in modern day, most cloud services uh, have the expectation that they provide uh, what's called audit log telemetry, meaning they provide you a stream of your own information about people logging in and accessing the data in your service, whether it's OneDrive or Dropbox, those are the two you mentioned, um, that they allow for those accesses to be securely monitored by a third party. And that third, third party could be you, or you could hire a third party to monitor accesses to those cloud systems for breaches. So I would say understand uh, the data residency of your, your file service and where that, that data is being stored. Understand and look for commitments from the service provider that they take security seriously and that the explanations they provide make sense. And then finally, um, it is important that you monitor your cloud services for breaches. That, that last bit is something that is often overlooked. Um, there's a sense sometimes that, hey, if I'm paying somebody to store my data in the cloud, that's a, 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 um, a one price service, and I, they're looking after security. And it is true, they are looking after security to a point, they're managing the security of their own platform. But just like managing a file server on your on-premise network, they still see you as being responsible for monitoring the accesses to your data and making sure that you're practicing strong uh, health and hygiene of the service, so passwords and, and, and access controls and so on. I do have, if I may, we have a few questions coming in, if that's all right. May I just um, quote? Yeah, interesting one. Um, so somebody truly loves that you quoted an ancient military general, which I love as well, beautiful quotes. Um, so what are the employees' responsibilities in all this? If you could perhaps comment on that, Andrew. That's a great question. And that really goes to um, what I was saying in terms of finding a framework that works for you and then starting to check off the key pieces, the found out foundational pieces um, that are uh, essential for, for a business uh, today um, to, to have uh, checked off. And so one of those would be an IT policy, the development of an IT policy or an IT security policy. So the first thing to understand is that employees will not naturally just understand um, the accepted way or even the best way to comport themselves when dealing with the IT infrastructure in your business. In fact, what, what they will most often do is find the most effective way to get their job done. And they will see that as um, uh, the best way to help the business. So I can tell you uh, from experience that we've dealt with customers where um, they, they called us, they had a breach, and uh, they, they uh, disconnected the ne their network from the internet to prevent uh, further communication from the attacker. Well, what the employees started doing is uh, going across the street, um, buying uh, um, uh, LTE uh, USB sticks from a cell phone provider and sticking it in their computer because they thought they were enabling the business to continue while working against uh, the actions of the incident responders within the company and, and, and with us. So um, the responsibility uh, on the part of the employees really has to be stated up front and it has to be clear and, and well understood. A, a fairly common and um, um, uh, uh, effective measure as well is to program cybersecurity awareness training into your organization. And, and typically this works best if it's recurring, so it's not a welcome to the company and here's your awareness training, um, but uh, it's on a recurring basis. So a lot of organizations use spear phishing exercises to help raise awareness uh, with their employees as to what spear phishing looks and feels like, as well as what some of the techniques uh, would be like. So I would say that employees have a variety of responsibilities, but you, you do need to spell them out in an IT policy or IT security policy and make them aware. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for sharing that. That's uh, very helpful. Um, 
going in terms of uh, to, towards personal responsibility, um, one question was as well asked, if you could please provide and repeat your recommendations to safeguard um, your personal devices, maybe briefly. Your personal devices. Okay. Um, that's a little bit different. In some ways, it's easier. In some ways, more difficult uh, than securing uh, uh, enterprise devices. And the reason is that one of the most essential ways to secure a network is to have visibility into what the network is doing. So that means monitoring. So whether that's with a network sensor or endpoint agents um, in the consumer context, you might think of that like antivirus, um, but it is to have visibility into to, to what's going on in your network. And these features are not typically uh, available um, uh, at a consumer level. Uh, so as, as an individual, uh, I would say um, there's a few things you can do. The first is uh, the, the, the recommendation to patch your systems uh, is an extraordinarily powerful, important one. So make sure that all your devices stay up to date, even if it's a little bit of a pain to have to reboot your computer and so on. Uh, the second thing that we would highly recommend is to uh, implement and use a password manager. Uh, the days of trying to remember passwords in your head or writing them down or using the same password uh, on even more than one single network or one single system are over. And so um, if you go to Field Effects uh, website on our blog, uh, there's actually a section on um, password managers and how to use them and, and why they're helpful. Uh, but I would say to make sure that you're using a password manager. Um, and the third thing that I would say that'd be really easy to do and um, is great in a, a made-in-Canada context is that the organization that I mentioned multiple times, CIRA, um, they offer a free service for Canadians uh, that um, you can change the, the, the DNS settings on your network and they have very simple explanation as to what to do, but they provide a free service that you can connect to your home network and use it to block accesses to known bad websites out on the internet, whether it's phishing or malware uh, or what have you. So, so that would be the third recommendation I've had. Great, and I do believe we have time for one more question, which I think is the most popular here. Um, you had mentioned the bombing in, in a video conference. And um, mm -hmm. the question is, was this more likely that someone found the link or a hack, or how does it happen? And if you have explained it already, if you could maybe summarize one more time, because video conferencing in particular is being utilized on a number of different platforms these days. Yeah, um, I, 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 I will state up front that I, I didn't do a deep dive anal analysis as, as to specifically um, how it was occurring, but, I, but I, what I can tell you is that um, any time that you make something really easy, so it's just click a link and then you have access to something, unless you have an added authentication layer, like in Zoom, they now have uh, uh, mm -hmm. video conferencing passwords. Um, if you don't have that layer, um, then you open yourselves up to things like Zoom, Zoom bombing. Now, what I think happened, and this is really an important thing to take away for cybersecurity in general, is that hackers aren't sort of randomly doing things. They, they are using technology and programming and automation to their advantage. And so basically, if it is programmatically possible to cycle through all the different meeting IDs that might be going on in a Zoom session, and that the URL that you see at the top of the browser is predictable, and there is no password required to get into that, and there is no control uh, limiting whether or not guests can actually post pictures within um, uh, a video conferencing session, then you have a recipe for what happened there. And so um, basically what I expect happened is, is that um, the nuisance threats, the, the, the hackers identified that there was a way they could programmatically uh, cycle through the list of sessions, yeah. Absolutely. We are almost at the end of the, the webinar. Um, I would like to, first of all, once again, Andrew, thank you very much. And thank you to Field Effect. Uh, that was incredibly insightful and informative. Uh, I hope for everyone else. And I would like to thank all the audience, everyone who participated and registered for this webinar. 
you will be receiving from us uh, an email in about two days with a link to the webinar. Any questions that we weren't able to answer, you can reach out as well to Field Effect or the Chamber directly, and uh, we will collect all the questions. So we do have, uh, we keep a database. And um, that's pretty much it for myself as well today to thank you once again. And I do really hope I see you again at one of our upcoming webinars. I hope you enjoyed it. Wish you a wonderful day and thank you once again, um, Field Effect and Andrew and all the participants. And um, till the next time, thank you very much. Bye for Thank now. You. Take care. Thank you.